Episode 13, my conversation with Bart Burrell. I want the reward on the other side. And the reward to me is living again. As one of the doctors said, our job is to keep you alive. Your job is to live. I didn't do this just to breathe. I did it to live. I'm Paul Estridge, and this is Survive in Advance, a show from the People Forward Network. Let's learn to face life's greatest challenges and move forward together. In the journey through life, there's no substitute for having friends to reach out to for advice and support, especially when you're facing your greatest challenges. Bart Burl and I have been close friends for many years, and we've encouraged and supported each other through countless life events. Yet we never could have imagined the importance our friendship would have in our lives. In our conversation, you'll hear how Bart's experience as an accomplished college athlete prepared him for decades of fighting life-changing illnesses. In the end, Bart's faith and unrelenting focus made him thrive in the face of overwhelming obstacles. My first experience with anything of tragedy, if you will, is when my father passed away unexpectedly at age 57, and I was 32, 33. Well, then about seven years later, I started having some health issues. Always worked out and did some things, and I suddenly found myself unable to do that. Couldn't figure it out and started seeing doctors as to what was wrong, and that was in January. And finally figured it out in September of that year. So I had been to many, many tests to try to figure out why I was having difficulty breathing. And finally, at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, they told me I had amyloidosis. That is a bone marrow illness that you produce an extra protein, basically, that your body cannot get rid of. And it accumulates someplace. Mine accumulated in the heart which is probably the worst place for it to accumulate. So your heart gets stiff and thick. And they, when they told me that, they started running me through a variety of tests, and they came back and they were saying, we're looking at a heart transplant at that point in time or a stem cell transplant as a form of treatment. And I said, well, if I did nothing, what would happen? And they said, oh, you have three to six months to live, which was quite a shock for a previously in shape 40-year-old. Anyway, they ended up doing a stem cell transplant. And I remember vividly you coming up to Lafayette and we took a walk and I just basically said to you, Paul, I have faith and everything, but I'm not where you are. I want to be where you are. I, I looked at your faith as much stronger than mine at the time. And then you helped me through that process. You bought me some books. You bought me a Bible. We talked a lot, and that was hugely helpful. And I took a couple of things to Rochester with me because at the time, the stem cell transplant for an amyloid patient, about 25% of the people, the treatment alone would kill them. And so you know, I was going up there hoping to come back. And anyway, when we went through that, it was very difficult. Um, you were the only friend allowed up there, basically, because I got very selfish trying to concentrate on myself to get better. At the time, I remember Nancy, my wife, saying, hey, so-and-so wants to come and visit you. What do you think? And I would just say, I just can't do it. I can't entertain somebody or talk to somebody. I just, I just had to, I was being very selfish just to try to save all the energy I could to fight this thing. So we went through that, and I did get to come home, and I remember waking up and just feeling horrible, just horrible still. I was in an apartment just across the street from the hospital where we would go in and out of daily. And I remember waking up and coming out, and I just cried. And I just said, am I ever going to get better? It had beaten me down. I was trying so hard to be positive. I mean, I just went back to my roots of football. And if you're going to beat an opponent, you got to know about the opponent. You've got to have a positive attitude. you got to think you're going to win or you're going to lose. And so I, I just tried all of those things so hard, and I think it just wore me out. I just was like, it's not working. It was a long game, wasn't it? It, it was a long game, and I, I was beaten up. Bart, when you're told that you have a disease that you're not going to live from, and that you have to take a treatment that 25% of the people don't live from it, 
What do you do with that reality? Uh, help us understand what that feels like. Uh, well, for me, at that time in my life, it was quite a shock. And going home, my mother was taking care of our kids at the time when we went up there to figure out what was wrong with me and never expecting to hear what I heard when I was up there. And so when we came back, I told my wife, I just said, you got to tell mom, I can't tell her. And I would just went upstairs. <clears throat> and then we lived near campus and it was football homecoming. And a lot of people came over to the house the next day. And I, I couldn't go say hi. I was depressed. I was shocked. I, was, I, I had been punched and I fell down. I, I wasn't up yet. So Sunday evening, Nancy said to me, are you going to quit or are you going to fight this thing? And I was like, what do you think? And she was, I don't know. I don't know the way you're acting. And I said, you're right. You're absolutely right. I'm not going to beat this this way. And so that was my turning point. Her honesty is what really turned me around. And so we started at that point with that game plan of being positive, trying to find good things to happen. How am I going to attack this thing? That was really when I just developed a game plan at that point in time. And then I just tried to execute the plan. And so I, I tried to take my mind off of all the bad stuff and just, how can I handle this? What can I do to make this better? When did you get moments of encouragement as you went through this? My goal was to set records. I'm going to be the fastest guy in and out of here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And things were going really, really well. And one of the doctors said, hey, you are doing great. And like the next day, you know, I got an infection. So then I ended up back in the hospital for in the intensive care area for a couple of weeks. And that was the hardest time because just one thing would fail after another. It was your kidneys and your liver. Then your, of course, it was always the heart. There were some really tough times, but I, I always felt at peace during that time. I never thought I'm going to die or I just didn't, I didn't spend any time on that. I just felt an incredible sense of peacefulness during that whole time. What do you attribute that to? I attribute it to faith, to realizing up to that point in my life, I thought I controlled everything. And I suddenly realized I, real, I did not have that control. You're, you don't know what's going on inside of you. Still to this day, they don't know what causes amyloidosis. So there was nothing I did to myself to, to cause it, as far as anybody knows. Were you okay with dying at that time? I did not want to. And it was really more for my family than for fear for myself or anything. So that was something I did not want to do at all. I mean, I was fighting not to die. For and your to, family, though. For my, yeah, for, really for my family. But internally, you were at peace with it? Yeah, yeah. I was at peace. Now, even it was really, I just didn't really think, okay, I'm going to die. I just was at peace. I don't know. I didn't spend time focusing on that at that point in time, during those toughest times. Now, obviously, at some point in time, when I broke down at the at near the end, it had worn me out. Um, and I don't know that I was thinking about dying. I was just thinking, am I ever going to get better? It's a long battle. Well, I remember I was there one one of those points in times, and your face was swollen, your feet were swollen, but you got through all those, didn't you? I did somehow. I made it through it all. And I, I would go back all the time for annual checkups, and then if I had any issues, would have to stick around. Yeah. You were good for another 15 years for the most part, but you had some tough moments in your life between that time. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, my sister, it was two years after I had gotten home, she ended up having a cancer in her brain, sinus area, right above the eyes, and they didn't think there was anything they could do for her. And so she went from really very little hope to surviving for 10 years, and then she passed away after that. And then my mom passed away as well. And so th those were all, all difficult times. When I went back up, they told me I I had some other issues with my heart that I was unaware of, and ventricular tachycardia, which basically your heart stops beating for several beats. And mine had, would stop beating for like oh, four or five beats for maybe 15 times throughout the day. I did not know that. I mean, I couldn't feel that, which is fine, which is good. He goes, but if it stops for 40 beats or 50 beats, that's called sudden death. 
that's when they ended up putting a defibrillator and a pacemaker in 2015. And then I had to have an ablation and some other things. And so all of that really started occurring at that point in time. So take us forward then. Well, you know, I started having a little bit more issues, but I always said, you know, if when I was 35, healthy in my mind, if you would have told me when I hit 40, this is the way your life is going to look for the rest of your life. That would have been very depressing to me. I mean, I would have just thought, I don't know if I can handle that. But looking back those 20 years, I don't think I could have had a better life. Sure, I went through some issues. I couldn't do things that I used to do. But the one thing that I did have is a perspective. And I had a faith. And I realized that I got more out of those 20 years than I ever would have gotten out of those 20 years had that not happened to me. I would have gone through life thinking I, I was in control, probably being a little too cocky, probably taking everything for granted, but I didn't. I mean, I was so fortunate to be where I was. That's what I looked at and how, how happy I was and how, how many blessings that I did have. I had some friends that bought me a treadmill because you know when I got home in December, it was very cold out and you couldn't walk outside or anything. And so I remember when they put it together, they did it in our basement and I was upstairs when they were doing it. And then they called me down. And so I got down there. And to be honest, at the time, just getting down those stairs was a feat. And they put me on that treadmill and they said, okay, here's how it works. And it starts off at the slowest speed, 0.5. And he goes, now all you gotta do is turn it up here. And I go, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I couldn't turn it up. I could not go any faster. And I was able to do it for 10 minutes, which was a major feat the first time I did it. Well, from that day on, I would get better and better. And every time I quit, I turned it back to 0.5 and would walk that way for about 10 to 20 seconds just to remember how far I had come. So that, that was kind of the attitude I took those whole 20 years, how lucky I am, not how, how unfortunate I have been. Why me? I, ne I never once thought the why me. I don't know why. It just that never even came to my mind. It was just okay. How am I going to how am I going to get through this? And, you, you talk about how really great the last twenty years have been, and it's been a blessing. I'll never forget about a week after I got home from two and a half months in intensive care. I was praying for all the things I'm grateful for, and it came across me that. Oh my gosh, I am grateful for this whole disease that I have just endured and the transplant experience. As difficult as it was, it has changed me. It's transformed me in a way that I am now grateful for having had it. Did you feel that way? Absolutely. Absolutely. And when I would speak to people, I would always end it by saying, my hope and wish and goal for all of you is that you could feel like I do without going through what I went through. But unfortunately, I don't think you can. I think you have to be brought to your knees to a large degree to have the appreciation that you and I have for what we've been through. And that appreciation is not one of sorrow. It's one of, it's true appreciation. Man, I went through this and I am so fortunate that I have had that experience in my life because I look at life differently and in a more positive way. Do you find that one of the things that we do more now is that we appreciate others more than we ever did? Absolutely. Absolutely. And my the way I'm built, a fault of mine, perhaps, is I've never been able to show that emotion as well and express my love and gratitude for people the way I feel. I'm better, but I'm still not perfect at it. But yes, I absolutely feel that way. When I was first sick, one of the things that I wanted to do was help other people. And so I thought I needed to go through this whole thing flawlessly so that I could tell everybody, hey, you can do this. This is not a problem. And when I went through all those issues, I remember telling my doctor, I said, I'm disappointed. I thought I was going to be your model patient and I could really help you. And she said, oh, Bart, I think you can help me more because you weren't, it wasn't easy for you. And so I said, well, if you ever have anybody you want me to talk to, I'm happy to talk to them. So she did. She would, because of the amyloidosis is a very rare illness. And at the time, 
with the internet, it kind of just started and everything. And there really wasn't a lot of success stories for people to talk to. And so I did talk to several. And uh, a couple of things that I learned in that is one of the things that I said from the very beginning is it's going to be hard and you're going to, everybody's going to be talking about you and your health and what you can do. And it's only natural to save all of your energy and all of your thoughts to how am I going to get through this? And the one thing that I did was I didn't pay enough attention to Nancy, my, my wife, and what she was going through at the time and how hard it was for her because she always presented a positive face to me, which is what I needed. But it fooled me as to what she was going through. And so the first thing I always told people is, the hardest job is not yours, it's your caregivers. And you cannot forget about them and what they're going through. And I didn't know that until I got home. And months later, when I'm stable and everything's going pretty good in the recovery process, it takes a long time as you get your strength and all the other things back, but you're feeling much, much, much better. And at that point is when I started realizing she'd been hurting a lot worse than I ever thought she was. And so that's where my selfishness and trying to get better, I felt horrible about that and not giving her enough attention. So when people would say, she'd go, Bart, your friend wants to come and visit you. What do you think? I'd say, no. What I didn't realize is she was up there alone. She wanted those people up there to support her, to, for her to have a reasonable, to take her out of that problem. I mean, that problem that I had and she was dealing with just for a moment, just to give her some, a little break from it. And I didn't even think of that. And so that's the one thing I always told people, don't forget about that. It's really hard. You survived that, but then you started having problems again. Tell us about that. Well, they were just breathing issues and arrhythmia issues and everything. And it would get harder. I could never lay down to sleep because I couldn't breathe well enough. And just a lot of, of issues that I, I just learned to deal with. I mean, I just lived with, and I was just happy with what I had. But then I really had a hard time. I went to this friend of mine's pretty much his one-year anniversary after he had a lung transplant. His name was Paul, by the way. And he had a little gathering with his nurses and friends and stuff to celebrate that. And shortly after that, I was really having trouble breathing, and I would just break out in cold sweat. I mean, sweats like I was still playing football sweats. I mean, had to change the sheet sweat at night. And I would do that a couple of times and just was having a really bad time. And so I got in touch with the doctors and said, you know, I got to come and see you again. And so we did. And when we got there, there was some other issues that they discovered and they had to figure those out first. And that was, I had pneumonia. I didn't know it. And so that's when I went to Mayo in late September. And the year before, when he saw me, he goes, man, you look a lot better in person than you do on paper. And I said, I don't know how to take that, but I'll take it as a compliment. And I'd say, well, what can I do? He goes, whatever you're doing, just keep doing the same thing. Anyway, so a year later, he said, Bart, I think it's time we start looking at a heart transplant. And then during that process, it determined I needed a liver as well because I had cirrhosis of the liver, and that made no sense to me whatsoever. For the previous 20 years, I didn't drink very much, and I'm not a diabetic, and I'm not overweight. Those are the three common things of why you would have cirrhosis. And they said, no, you have it. And so they did some more testing. And so I did qualify, went into the hospital February 22nd, waiting to receive a heart and a liver. And so I was in the hospital about, oh, three and a half weeks when something became available. And I remember we were just sitting there on a Saturday and the doctor came in and they said, are you ready for a transplant? And I said, well, yeah, that's why I'm here. And he goes, okay, we've got some organs for you. But I will say the, the thing that I had thought about a little bit, but not a lot, is when you're going into the surgery. And uh, again, I felt a calmness at that point in time. By this point in my life, I was doing this because I wanted a better 
life for my wife who had put up with me for 20 years and all the stuff I'd been going through and my kids and grandkids. And I really wasn't doing it for me. I was doing it for them. And I know that sounds easy to say, but it's really true. And I think that happens with other transplant people. I don't think selfishly you're just doing it for yourself. You're doing it because you want those around you to have a better life going forward than what you, you were allowing them to have. I mean, you feel like a burden to your family to a degree, and you don't want that. You want them to have a good life, and that means you having a good life. And so th th those were the goals. My goals weren't so I could play more golf or so I could do it. It wasn't that at all. It was just to be able to have a, a life that was more enjoyable for those around me who had put up with me for so long. So how many months out are you from uh, your transplants? Um, getting close to six months. Yeah. How do you feel today? I feel really blessed. I feel I feel good. The hardest thing for me is just adjusting to all the medications you take. But as far as I can sleep flat on my back now, you know, I walk at least two and a half miles every morning. I can't do a lot of the weightlifting that I'd like to do to be able to get back to a reasonable weight. I can lift five pound dumbbells and up to 10 pound dumbbells now. But they, but because it's mainly because of my liver, because the stomach, they cut through all those stomach muscles. And you have to let those muscles heal. And if you don't, the odds of getting hernias are very high. So, Bart, as you look forward in your life, have you dialed in exactly what you want to do and how you want to make the best use of it, realizing that someday you will die and not living as if you won't die? What you really want to accomplish for the rest of your life? Again, I did not go through a transplant just to survive. I did it to live. The first six months, I've been very cautious because that's when your immune system's the worst. One of the sayings that I used, and I think you used it as well, is keep rowing for shore. And to me, that's you need a good, a great faith, and you need the good Lord to help you out. But there comes a point when you have to do your job, too. And you have to do take care of your part of the equation. And that, that's the keep rowing for sure. And so I just keep rowing for sure. And I don't want to do something stupid that would cause me to ruin this opportunity that this donor gave me, as well as what I've been through and what I've put my family through. I want the reward on the other side. And the reward to me is living again. As one of the doctors said, our job's to keep you alive. Your job is to live. I didn't do this just to breathe. I did it to live. And so I want to be able to live again. And in my mind, that goal has always been about a year from the initial surgery that I will try to just move forward and not think about it as much. I mean, certainly as a transplant patient, you have to have, you have to take some cautions, but you also have to live. And so that's my goal. And that is really to make life better for Nancy and my kids and my grandkids and my friends. All those people that have put up with so much from, from me, I hope to be able to just enjoy that time. I've always enjoyed the time with them. I want them to enjoy the time with me. I don't want them to feel like, oh, we got to take care of Bart or we can't do this because of Bart and, and all of those things. So I really have done it for family and friends as much as anything. So that's what I want to do. And then I also want to be able to help others. And I don't know how that is. And if this podcast is somehow helpful to somebody, then I am very pleased. And if I can help others get through some of the things just from my experiences, I will be very happy. But taking everything in consideration, not necessarily limiting it to your health issues, but what was the most difficult time you've ever gone through? I would probably say that the the shock of my father passing away was my first wake up call. Life had been really good up to that point. Of course you have your ups and downs like any young kid would have, young person would have, but it was really good. And that was the first time that it was just like a shock to my system. I remember that day and I vividly remember sitting in your family room when you walked in from Lafayette for the first time to deal with your father's passing it was very hard. But you handled it like a man, and it was a model for me for when my, my father died and my mother died. I think in the past, our kinship to each other was 
on both being achievers, having accomplished a lot in our lives. Now, I think of us more as survivors. And do you think of yourself as a survivor and why? Yes, I do. And your observations are spot on. It was based on achievements, obviously friendship. But as you were talking, I sat there and thought of how many things we've gone through together, but nothing like what we've gone through together right now. The surviving part is probably the most rewarding thing that I've done, though. I mean, the achievements were great. And at that point in my life, they were the most important thing, probably. That's probably why I achieved them, because they were that important to me. But the, when somebody says you're a survivor, in a way that, that to me, it said you're thinking about yourself. I'm a survivor. I, but it, it's really not that way. You, you have survived, but you're not thinking about it for yourself. You're thinking about it for others. And you're thinking about it, you know, this donor family was able to give a gift to you. and at a great cost to their family uh, and the people that are, are, have been left behind. What you can do for others going forward because of the experiences you've had can be much more than I've ever done in my life so far. And this podcast you're doing, I hope many people get to listen to it because they will all find themselves in that position at some point in time, whether it's their loved one or themselves or whoever. But being a survivor, is it's not a selfish thing. It's a much bigger than that. It's a grateful thing, don't you think? Grateful. That's a wonderful way to put it. Yeah, it's very grateful. And when you're grateful and you're truly grateful, it's a wonderful feeling. What does it mean to you to survive in advance? Well, Paul, to me, it means to keep rowing for shore, to keep doing your part, to not give up, to take this wonderful opportunity you've been given and take advantage of it. And to take advantage of it, you just don't survive. You have to advance. Again, I didn't do this to survive. I did it to advance. I did it to be able to help others, to be able to bring joy to others, to be able to bring happiness to others, especially those others that have done so much for me, and to let them know how grateful I am and that they too can overcome whatever gets in their way, if they just keep rowing for shore and don't give up. And it's a feeling that you can't replace. It's a an attitude that makes you sleep well at night. It's really the greatest thing you can have. I'm so blessed to have had these opportunities. You don't think of them as opportunities at the time, but looking back, they're just wonderful opportunities that you've had. And that you've been able to work with, not against, but just to work with and work with on improving yourself and having a better life, not just for you, but for others. What keeps you rowing for sure? Gratitude. I mean, I, I am grateful for what those around me have done for me, and I'm rowing for sure for them. I am grateful for the opportunities that I've been given. And I just want to keep rowing for sure to have more and to be able to share those with others. As far as some people don't like to talk about their illnesses or are very private about them. And I understand that. But at the same time, Paul, you and I are in a position where a lot of people know about them anyway. And if I can somehow help somebody because of what I've been through, help them get, go through something they are either one going through now or two will be going through in the future, then that keeps me going. And I, I don't have any problem at all sharing that with them. Because if there's something that they can learn from me that will help them, that's a success. The part that inspires me the most about Bart Burrell is his intense discipline. Whether it was in athletics, or facing a life-threatening disease more than once. Secondly, watching Mayo Clinic and looking at him twice his size on the bed and not knowing if he was going to make it, I watched him never quit, and that inspired me. Learning to not quit when you're faced with physical challenges in life or business challenges in life or relational 
challenges in life are much different than when your life is on the line and you don't know if it's, if it's all over. You have to find this don't quit inside of you that you've never really had to call upon before. So that's what I saw in him and it inspired me to not quit. What Bart's friendship meant to me, especially when I went through my tough times, is that he was there with me. He was the first one to text me. He was always the person that I would listen to as he now gave me guidance on how to not quit, listen to the doctors, have faith, and you'll get through it. Thanks for listening to Survive in Advance, a show from the People Forward Network. I'm Paul Estridge, reminding you to keep moving forward and always be grateful. Let's stay connected. Send me an email at surviveinadvance at estridge.net.